Hi everybody, and welcome to part two of Demons. Um, as just a just as a quick reminder, uh, this is the um, second uh, edition of a series of videos, a long series of videos that I'll be updating regularly on my website at adamduff.com. I'll leave a uh, leave a link in the description. Um, it's which is uh, which is. The entire purpose of it is for you to, to have an opportunity to meet other artists, uh, leave comments, ask questions. You can ask me directly. I'll, I'll do my best to respond to everybody's comments. Um, of course, it'll get harder and harder as more and more people join up, but I'm generally good for that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, so you can go and check it out in the link and, uh, and offer your feedback and share some feedback. That being said, um, I've already given you an idea of these characters um, in terms of their backstory, so I'm not going to uh, dwell on that too much. I'm going to discuss the painting and design process a little bit more. Uh, but as much as it is uh, aesthetic and physical, the actual act of painting, it is also a thought process. So I want to make sure to share that with you because that really is, in my opinion, the most important part. Everybody's going to have their own uh, way to um, express themselves artistically, but um, getting yourself into the right headspace is, can make the difference between you having a successful art, art day or a non-successful art day, right? So that's important. Now at this particular point, I have already fleshed out the base tones, I've already fleshed out the three-dimensional forms, the, the basics of the anatomy, and now it's just a question of having fun and adding detail. Um, so at this particular point in a painting, your stress level drops, your confident. It's just you, you, you don't have to um, break the mold, so to speak. You, the creation process is already passed, and now you can just noodle around with details. But at the same time, um, although the stress level is uh, uh, drastically lower, um, your focus needs to stay top-notch. So as you're designing, you're constantly mentally referring back to the narrative of this character. Uh, not only referring back to it, but pushing it. You're always pushing your designs further. You're always trying to get more out of it, right? You want to you want to impact your audience. You want them to feel something. So you're constantly thinking of how can I push this further so that people really, really respond to it the way I want them to. I really want people to be affected by my artwork on an emotional level, right? Not everybody's going to have it be a uh, emotionally uh, affected to the point where they're, you know, it actually upsets them or thrills them, so to speak. But what it does do is it captures their imagination. And that is a part of the whole emotional reaction process that I'm talking about. Uh, when I posted this work the first time, I got a very good response. Uh, but the response wasn't, oh, you know, this is so dark, you know, this is so painful, it's hard to look at. It wasn't that type of a response. It was more of a, wow, this is really powerful stuff, right? And that is, that's really what I was going for. I'm not looking for deep uh, philosophical or poetic uh, reply, responses to this work. I want people to enjoy it, right? And that's that's the kind of response that I was going for. But I know that that response was linked to how it impacted them emotionally by looking at the work, right? Now, as far as his headdress and everything like that's concerned, um, and how I'm designing it, how I'm rendering out these different things, I'm constantly focused around pain. I'm thinking about stress. I'm thinking about suffering. And uh, the idea behind it is making it so tight and so uh, inhibiting as a headdress, as a neck brace type of thing, that it completely immobilizes you, or him in this particular case. Um, so I wanted to suggest that it was actually fastened, pierced into the skin. And the idea, if you wanted to compare that to something with the actual idea that inspired me, if you think of uh, those uh, wrap band, those bandage wraps, like those, um, it's not gauze, but it's made of elastic, you can pink usually, and it, it'll, you can wrap it around your wrists or your knees or whatever, and it usually has this little metal clip that fastens onto the, onto the um, bandage to hold it in place. Well, that was the idea. I had the neck brace with those stress points on his chest where it kind of pierces the skin and pulls on it. I wanted to suggest that it was actually fastened into his skin to add to that feeling of it being uh, a painful device. I wanted to stretch his mouth out. So when I was designing it, I wanted to make sure that I was pulling it beyond that level of comfort with his lips. If you ever if you've ever made kind of scary faces where you stick your fingers in your mouth and you stretch your mouth open and you go, and to freak out your friends, 
there's a certain point where it actually becomes painful where you're you can feel that pull in your top and bottom lip it's it's where you feel like you're stretching it to the point where you could actually tear the skin i wanted to really pull that push that limit to a certain degree and from that point um i started to noodle around a little bit with his hand i was trying to figure out what i wanted to do with his other hand did i want it up or down and the first idea i had as you can see here was to design this oh, well the first idea was to give him a walking stick and I immediately realized no that's not going to work because it's going to be too redundant with uh, Anguish the character in the middle so I thought okay well maybe I'll, I'll give it a, him a mace in his hand uh, something he can pummel somebody with and it still didn't work and I was when I asked myself why I realized well it's because I'm starting to take you away from the character it's becoming more about his his the threat is no longer really him as much as it's this huge uh, jagged mace of his, right? And um, from in an, on an emotional level, it's actually weakening that character. So I, I, I realized what I wanted to play with was his weight. His real weapon is his weight. That's the threat of this character. It's the type of character that if he puts, if he pins you down with his hand or hand or his foot or his body, God forbid, I wouldn't want to be under that guy. I digress. But um, if I did that, then um that's the real that's the suffering right it's his physical body it's the fact that he's he's an abusive character so um by adding the mace i took away from that so to add to his sense of weight to push that weapon the weapon of his weight i referred to memories i had of watching documentaries or hearing people talk about uh, protesting, you know, protesters, political or whatever the case might be. Very often they would talk about how if you're ever being, if the police or somebody's ever trying to drag you off, go limp. Because when you go limp, uh, your center of gravity drops and you're, you're twice as heavy, you're twice as hard to carry. Even my, like my four-year-old daughter, when she goes limp, not that she's protesting when she's just goofing off, you know, <laughs> hell no, we won't go. You know, that'd be fun hearing that from a four-year-old. But, um, you know, like my even my I have a one year old son, and if I'm carrying, if he doesn't want to be lifted, he'll go, <laughs> he'll start to fuss and go limp, and he's heavy. A little one year old guy, he gets quite heavy, but if he's actually holding on to me and he's holding on to my arm, then he he's very light. I can carry him around for a long time, right? Um, but that's the whole idea behind it. So to push that um, sense of weight, I decided in the end after fiddling around with this this. Uh, this mace type of idea to drop his arm and by dropping his arm I'm, I'm I'm emphasizing his relaxation the relaxation in his body and by doing that I'm making him tw twice as heavy so instead of giving him this mace or giving him a weapon in his hand all I did was kind of I decided to fashion this kind of glove this metallic glove that was kind of welded onto his skin for two reasons one is it adds weight in a downward pulling fashion right it's no longer lifted. Now it's down. You're going to see. I'm going to start working on it now. And the second thing is, um, adds to that sense of pain, right? It adds to that feeling of pain, where he's got devices that are actually pierced into his skin, screwed into the back of his cranium, pulling his mouth apart. There's a lot of pain involved there, but it's pain to show you. Um, it's not the pain he's going to inflict on you. Those devices are hurting him, not you. It's pain to show you his resilience, his emotional resilience against pain. So if he can do that to you, if he can do that to himself, imagine what he can do to you, right? When you see somebody, if you are watching somebody, and I remember there was a guy I knew once at one point who, who kind of get this kind of sick pleasure out of hurting themselves. I remember this one guy I knew a long time ago. I went to his place and he was like, hey, check this out. And he showed me he had this T-shirt of his. It was covered in blood stains, And I was like, what the hell? You know? And he says, yeah, yeah, a couple of years ago I got into a fight and he kicked the crap out of me and I was just bleeding everywhere. And he goes on telling me a story about this and I'm sitting there going, him telling me stories about him getting hurt made him scary to me. I thought, there's something wrong with this guy. If he's into pain, then if he's in, if he treats pain that way, then there's probably something wrong with this guy, right? It, by him expressing his own suffering to me, he was making himself a threat to me, right? Emotionally. I don't know what this guy's capable of at this point, if that's how he reacts. So that's what these devices do in this particular context. You could also put it in the 
you I wouldn't put it in the empathy suffering uh, category, namely because he's so strong and because um, he's 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 a physically strong character. These devices aren't necessarily if I put them in the context of who they're attached to. I'm not really feeling for this guy. I'm not sitting going, ooh, that looks painful. I'm thinking that's probably not a big deal to somebody like that. So it's more of a, it's more of a, in the context of, of him showing you just how resilient he is towards his own pain and towards yours, ultimately, right? And then after that, uh, you'll notice that I'm rendering out the lighting on it. What's important to mention here is that this, this glove is only being affected by the firelight, quote unquote, that's in the front of the scene. But in order for that device, in order for that glove of his to be visible, it had to have a strong source of light. So that's why I'm pushing the highlights and pushing the contrast a little bit in it, but not to the point that it completely steals your attention away from the rest of the character. Right? That's the thing that's important at this point. And adding age, adding wear, adding tear, showing you that it's not just a new glove that he, you know, fashioned by the elves, smooth, polished silver. No, this has been slammed together with axes and hammers and brick and stone, right? It's a very crude weapon. So I've got to show the wear and tear in there. I've got to show that the specular highlights and the shadows are showing grooves and dents and all kinds of things to show just how he's fashioned it and probably who he's killed with it as well or who he's tortured with that is that device as well i also was deciding at this point whether or not i wanted to add a face to him you'll notice that very often i start characters with the skeleton uh first to get the 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 bone structure underneath uh, i find that to be a very effective way to uh to design characters i basically draw a suggestion of the skull and then I paint the skin over that. I, I generally find that's more effective and it's a little bit more of an intuitive way to construct a face rather than just starting with round forms type of thing. Um, um, but I decided uh, adding eyes to this character would give him too much soul and the whole idea behind him is that he is essentially soulless. He, he has no conscience. So by just suggesting a bit of a skin wrap around his head, around his cranium, and across his mouth and stuff like that, but leaving his eye sockets hollow, I was really creating this very um, void type character. And as you can see, then I jump straight on to anguish in the middle. Now, the idea, from a bit of an aesthetic perspective, um, but also a personality perspective, one of the things that inspired me with this guy was one of the characters from Lord of the Rings, uh, the scene where... Um, uh, Frodo's been captured by the orcs. They have stolen his mithril shirt, and now they're fighting over it. And one of the orcs kicks the other. They're fighting over it. He says, ah, give me that shiny shit. Which I always thought was, he was always saying, give me that shiny shit. <laughs> That's what I thought. I was like, what? But, and anyway, I figured it out pretty quickly. But he kicks the other orc through the hole, and then he falls, and it starts this chain event of, of fighting uh, within all the war, uh, the orcs, which um, which creates a distraction so Frodo and Bilbo can get away at that point. And at one particular point, the fight's really, this kind of brawl has really started off in the main hall, and this one orc walks in and peeks over his friend's shoulder and sees the fighting going on, and he goes like, Rrr! and he takes, he, he just leaps into this mosh pit of fighting, like just head on, like a psychopath. He just kind of got this bloodlust type of thing. Well, I really, that character really resonated with me. And I thought when I was designing him, I was, my brain kept funneling back to that character. And one actually it kind of reminds me at that point, a very good point of reference for creature design when you're doing this kind of stuff is check out prosthetic design. I know, uh, uh, What's his name? Uh, Gary Sepulveda, the uh, the uh, prosthetics designer for Lord of the Rings, the main, the, the head prosthetics designer, has some brilliant work. So f when it comes to demonic designs, macabre, disgusting, rotting, diseased type of creatures, he's really awesome for that. So I really suggest you go and check it out. Um, uh, and another uh, design reference that you can use is the films by Guillermo del Toro, because a lot of his films, he does a lot of... 
his movies have always been horror based, but it has a very, of course, as you know, if you've seen any of his films, has a very fantasy feel to it. And from a from a design perspective, the design is probably, in my opinion, some of the best out there. I really, really, really love his work. Um, like Hellboy 2 is a perfect example. Uh, um, Pan's Labyrinth is a good reference for different types of creature designs as well. Look up his stuff. Like, look up Guillermo del Toro design, creature design, and you're going to get a lot of good reference. Um, so that, those are two things you can check out. And one of the references it's good for is skin. Because uh, I'll, to give you a direct point of reference for how I'm approaching this, just so you can put it in context, is... Um, these demons don't have regular healthy human skin. They have kind of, they have very poor hygiene, right? They don't have the same diet we do. They don't eat the same food. They don't sleep the same way. They don't bathe. They're, they're filthy and, and a bit rotted. There's a bit of a death feel to their, to their skin tone. Um, but it's still skin. I still wanted it to feel like flesh, right? Um, uh, so I wanted to maintain that feel that there's some kind of oil in that skin, and that that will produce a certain type of uh, specularity, that a certain type of reaction, a certain type of a certain way of reacting with light. But if you were to compare that to a different type of creature design, a humanoid type of design, um, a good point of reference would be the kind of angelic demon character in Hellboy 2, the one that extracts the spearhead from Hellboy's heart. Uh, Brilliant design. Now, the the the, the skin uh, that this character has is ancient. It's almost like a mummy, right? He was like Death, so to speak, right? Or he is Death. I believe that is the name of the character. I think it's the character's name is Death. His skin is dry and 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 like parchment almost. So the the the, the material used for that prosthetic is very non. Uh, it's it's got it, it's got a certain type of finish on it that doesn't make it waxy and reflective. That's a really fun way of studying and playing around with different types of flesh because that's a very telling uh, element when it comes to creating not necessarily realistic but believable characters. Right? You want to feel that bone structure. You want to feel that flesh. You want to know what kind of flesh is sitting on their bones. Very. Often, this is where, sorry, I'm getting hiccups. This, this is very often where um, uh, artists fall a little bit short, especially like newer artists. They'll kind of like treat skin as something generic or they'll treat teeth as something generic. They'll just kind of apply a generic type of thing. And you got to think of the diet of these characters, right? Now, as far as how I'm designing out this, uh, designing this guy out, Anguish, I was thinking of, like I mentioned in the, in the last uh, part, I'm thinking about pain. And I'm thinking about, in this particular case, it's not so much about him being uh, void of emotion and empathy. For him, he's actually probably the most threatening of all of these characters from, in a physical, from a physical standpoint because he's, um, he's, he gets a real perverted joy out of... Um, out of causing other people pain. So people pain, like that character in The Hobbit, right? Uh, not in The Hobbit, in Lord of the Rings, like that orc, he gets off on it. So I wanted to really push the wear and tear of his flesh, the fact that his skin is just like kind of like, he, he's. you can imagine he's taking his own claws. He, I'm going to be painting these kind of like black metallic claws on him as well, probably that he fashioned himself and that he kind of stuck these... Um, stuck these shards of metal into his fingertips to, to create, to give him a more, you know, uh, to give him more piercing devices to torture you with type of idea. As you can see, I'm starting to do that now. Um, so I would imagine like he actually stuck his own fingernails into his cheeks and tore his cheeks open. So there's kind of like these pulled slits of flesh that pull between his cheekbones and his jawline, right? That type of idea. Um, and then he would fashion in these metal shards to hold his flesh in place, to hold his face in this very malicious grin type of expression. And to further push that grin, I thought of having one piece of that metal jabbed into his chin where it would actually create a bit of a hair lip thing going on with his bottom lip. It actually, he actually, imagine, you gotta 
imagine how he fashioned these things, right? So he probably created the shard of metal and then pulled his gum, his 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 bottom lip down, and jabbed his his lip into his chin, right, exposing his gums and exposing his crooked, sharp canine teeth as well, showing, a, show, exposing the fact that his his gum line is actually receded a lot because he's been messing around with his face so much. I, you kind of kind of picture that he's been um, he's been um, he sits in his he sits in his chamber or in his domain and he just sits there torturing himself and messing around with his flesh. You got to really kind of put yourself into a dark headspace when you're doing this. Um, and here at this point, I'm thinking of giving I was thinking of giving him some kind of wings or the kind of a um, some kind of a device strapped to his back, but really wasn't making any sense to me. I'm drawing it and thinking to myself, I don't know, this really isn't doing anything. The kind of idea behind it was to, because he was a smaller character next to this big guy, um, I was thinking to give him something to accentuate his height a little bit. But in the end, I realized it really wasn't necessary. He's, he's a strong enough character without it, and that really isn't contributing anything to his to his backstory, right? It's not really fitting within a narrative it's just kind of uh, that it's it's a good example of how um a purely aesthetic for the sake of aesthetic element really contributes nothing to a design all it does is add detail really doesn't make any sense in the case of suppression over on who's now over on the right i have to keep reminding myself what side it's on because i keep flipping my canvas in his particular case um it is accentuating his size Right, there is an his size is his weapon. In the case of anguish, his size isn't his weapon, so it's really not important for me to do anything to accentuate that. What is important is for me to accentuate his expression, his posture, to show that he's hunched over in pain. Essentially, right? He's been he's been doing this stuff to himself for a long time. He's, if you pierce enough ja, uh, metal shards into your spine, you'll eventually start to slouch a little bit. That's my guess. And I wanted to accentuate the sharpness, the jaggedness of these metal shards. So you'll notice that I'm the I'm adding a lot more specularity to these metal pieces than I did with anguish. With anguish, it's heavy metal and fastened to his body. In his particular case, he's been digging these things into his cranium. And uh, if you think about it in a, in a from an emotional perspective, jabbing these kind of metal things into your cranium is also going to mess with your brain, right? Which could kind of explain his emotional disposition, the fact that he's just so such a sicko type of idea, right? And when and I want us, I want you to feel pain looking at him. I want you to feel pain touching him. So there's. There's a two-sided coin to this, right? He has inflicted pain on himself, um, and it's purely pain-oriented. It's a, it, but it's not a heavy, uh, suffocating pain like suppression. It is a, an anxiety pain. It's a, uh, imagine pulling your fingernails off, pain, clawing. Imagine, like, I, I want to put you in the right headspace. Imagine taking, you have semi-long fingernails. I cut all my nails, so it's not a good example, but. Um, Imagine taking semi-long fingernails and not only pulling them down a chalkboard, you know, going down a chalkboard, but doing it with all of the strength in your hands so it tears your fingernails off and they start to bleed, right? Isn't that, isn't that just a what, – try to visualize that for a little while. Isn't that a nice thought? Well, you got to feel that to draw what I'm drawing, right, to draw that expression. That expression is a uh, – it's an anxiety. It's something that hits you right in your core. In your, You can feel that kind of anxiety in your jaw, right? It's, you notice when people hear the chalk, the, the fingernails on a chalkboard sound, they go uh, – and they, they grit their teeth because that's where you feel it. You feel it in your, in your saliva glands, right? So that's where I'm adding this kind of detail. For him as well, because he does have eyes and facial features – it's very important that I still don't inject too much soul into him. These are sociopathic characters. So their expressions, their eyes, are not indicative of thought process. They're indicative of a motivation, and only a motivation. And that motivation is uh, a very um, 
a very naughty one. It's a very unpleasant one, right? So that's why I decided not to give him irises. I decided just to give him those black demonic eyes because those are very... When you see people that wear those kinds of uh, contacts or even if you see like footage taken with... Um, with a night camera, a night vision camera, where people's pupils dilate, completely dilate, so you can see the blacks of their eyes. It creates a very soul, it kind of sucks the soul out of their face type of idea. So I decided to just give him these black eyes and make his facial expression um, nothing but malicious. Now, in his particular case, what's different than, uh, than suppression is he does need support. He needs help holding up his center of gravity. In the case of suppression, his body is very, very stable and very heavy. But in his case, because he's hunched over in pain, with pain so much, I also wanted to suggest exhaustion in his body as well. Okay, It's another type of suffering. He is... Imagine... Or you might not have to imagine if you've ever been through long-term pain of any kind. I remember there was a, there was a period um, there was a period in my life where I spent about six months constantly feeling ill to my stomach until I realized that it was actually gluten that was causing that problem. I was I basically felt like 25% nauseous for six months straight from the moment I woke up in the morning to the moment I went to bed. And it wasn't until I spoke with my sister who, who studied a little bit more of that stuff. She mentioned gluten and I cut it out of my diet and I've been perfect since. Um, but I was always exhausted. And it gets on your nerves after a while. You start to feel really tired after a while. You're, you're constantly, const your body's constantly fighting an uncomfortable feeling. Well, imagine having this happen to you and living with this type of pain constantly your whole life for years and years and years and years you eventually exhaust you become completely exhausted and worn out so in his particular case i had to move shift his center of gravity onto a support structure which is this very heavy walking stick and that's why i added that extra weight at the top of it to suggest the weight of this walking stick it's to show that it's a very important element when it comes to his uh, physical state, his posture. He needs that stick. He's not just he's not using it as a weapon. So I didn't give it spikes, right? I just added chains and weights to it to make it heavy. If it was a weapon that he hurt you with, I would it would be very easy for me to take this spike design that I've got going on and just integrate it into this kind of mace ball or something like that at the end of a stick. But that's not what he's about. It's him who's, who's, I want the pain to be on him and the exhaustion to be on him. And this is just a support element that he uses as he's walking around and doing naughty stuff. Something else to take into account that's important is um, that characters are not the only elements in a scene that should have a strong silhouette. Um, and everything, weapon design, uh, uh, set design, all of that stuff should have a, a strong silhouette as well, especially if it plays an important role in the overall aesthetic of the, of the scene. So in this particular case, I, wanted, I knew I wanted to add chains to his, to his walking stick type of thing. So those, you'll notice those hooks that I first fashioned um, are in silhouette as well, and they're off kilter, right? There's personality in this stick as well. It's not just his body that has this. And furthermore, you're going to see in a moment that I'm going to add a few strips of fabric hanging off of it. Um, a, to add some importance and draw your attention to it as an important narrative element of this character, but also in the context of this overall scene, because um, I had, I, I've started off by just jotting down over to, over to the right of this kind of hanging flag, that red hanging flag, and I didn't want them to, that to kind of counter clash with the rest of the scene. So generally to balance colors in a scene, I'll, I'll try to um, uh, repeat that color, not exactly the same color, but re repeat a color throughout the scene in different areas, in different focal areas of a scene. And red is a color that is very prominent. It is the color, it is the color that your eyes will always see first right? So I wanted to make sure that I only applied that red to areas that were of importance. And Anguish is a very central character. Uh, sorry if you're hearing noise outside, they're, they're fixing a roof next door. So somebody's using a chainsaw or something like that. Fixing a roof with a chainsaw. You're doing it wrong! In any case, I digress. Uh, so that's the whole purpose behind that. Um, remember that um, you can use color and you can use movement in a scene to draw 
your attention to certain areas. If, for instance, that um, that design element was uh, God, that's distracting. Sorry about that. If that design element was pulling your attention to something that was unimportant, it can ultimately detract from your overall scene. In that which case, take it out, right? But in this particular case, it's adding a very nice sense of movement. It's adding uh, depth because that I wanted that fabric to travel behind uh, suppression so that to show that he's actually further off into the background, which suggests that he's actually bigger than, than you're seeing him. If he was to move closer to the camera, he would actually be bigger than you're seeing him on screen. He's not actually standing right next to suppression. So there's a nice overlapping depth in the scene. And it's creating a color balance throughout the scene altogether. And last but not least, I'm going to fiddle around a little bit more with that hand of his uh, to add some of those, to add a little bit of refinement. Because, of course, you know, I want to make sure that they have, they have the right detail and the right tension. I wanted to push this, the, I wanted to push his knuckles to show that he's really gripping on tight to this thing. By having a strong grip, I'm suggesting that he's putting a lot of weight on it, right? He's not just holding it with a gentle, elegant hand. He's really holding on to this thing with his dear life because it's holding him up. And to add those metallic claws which are an extension of his expression, an extension of his personality, right? His face is the center of his personality, but I want to extend that personality throughout all the way to his other extremities as well. So I want to add those nice, nasty claws onto him. Uh, but that's it. That's it for part two. We're going to continue this in part three. So uh, thanks for watching.